20 species of buckwheats in Washington. Most of them are, are, uh, are perennial buckwheats, which are by far the most important of the butterflies. Uh, this is a field of buckwheats. This is, uh, this is up in the Blue Mountains. And uh, as John said, some of our buckwheats have, a, they host a lot of different, um, Mostly lichenids. Uh, we have the Mormon metal mark, which is no, no longer considered a lichenid, but all the other species that use these buckwheats uh, are lichenids. And uh, when I talk about using a plant, I'm talking about a host plant for the larvae. The larvae actually eat the plants. Buckwheats are also wonderful nectar sources. Just about everything will, will come to buckwheats for nectar. This is Eladum, the tall buckwheat. This is a buckwheat we see in great numbers in eastern Washington. And these are some of the butterflies that use them. Gray Hair Street, Columbia Blue, Mormon Metal Mark, Western Green Hair Street, and Sheridan's Hair Street. And now we can add to this the, uh, the Athlon Blue. So uh, some of these plants are really excellent hosts. A few factoids here. There's 253 species of, of buckwheats in, in the United States. Um, that's a really big genus. There's a lot of plants. Most of them are in the West. There's not very many species in the East. Uh, it's the fourth largest genus in North America. And by the way, so some of these slides you've seen before, so some of this is going to be a repeat, but we'll be using this to get into, the, into some information later in the program. Uh, only sedges, milk benches, and pensions have more species, so it's the fourth largest genus in, the, in, America, in North America. <clears throat> it's divided into seven subgenera. Four of these are in Washington and Oregon. <clears throat> and the importance of subgenera, you think, well, why are we talking so? We never talk about subgenera. But in, in this group, uh, there's this guy named James Revelle. He's kind of the godfather of everything buckwheat in North America. <clears throat> and uh, he's, he's written that uh, this, this uh, genus, Ariagonum, is badly in need of revision. It needs to be split up. And when uh, from experience with other plants, when they, when they start splitting up, Plants, they, they invariably split them on in known categories. So almost <coughs> what we call subgenera today are, are going to be full genera sometime in the future. <coughs> Again, we have 21 species of very in Washington. In Oregon, there's twice that many, a little over 40. And then a <coughs> species in Oregon, or in California. So the further south you go, the more there are of these things. Uh, we have six different genera of the lichenids who use buckwheats in our area. This is this is uh, northern buckwheat, one of our prettiest, one of our showiest buckwheats in Washington. <laughs> we have uh, some of the cloferies, which are the green hair, three of them are the green hair streaks. They use a total of five buckwheats amongst them. Blue copper uses seven buckwheats all by itself. The gray hair streak uses a couple. That's probably the low, they probably use more than that. Um, now the lupin and acma blues, these are part of the genus Plebeus. Uh, just the lupin and acma alone use at least 13 buckwheat Any questions? Questions? Yes? Um, so, if I have the butterflies you showed, are they moths? Or are they... Did the butterflies? Are they moths or butterflies? Oh, these are all butterflies, yeah. Yeah, we'll be talking only about butterflies tonight. Uh, there are moths that use these buckwheats as well. But, um, what, are the, what are the hairs? Like, why do they have the hairs? The hairs? These hairs around the edge? Yeah. Oh, oh that? Are you talking about the one that had the hair straight? Well, why do they, just why do they have the hairs on them? Um, you, you didn't mean you didn't mean this, did you? Well, I just meant yeah, the hairs on their body. They have a fuzzy body. They have the hairs. It, uh, all, all butterflies have some amount of fringe along the back edge of their wings, mm -hmm. and exactly why, I guess I don't really know. Uh, and uh, one group of our butterflies, which we call hair streaks, have these tails. That's that's what they call the hair streak. It's a streak that looks like a hair. Uh, anybody have any ideas why there's a fringe? I guess I don't really know. Uh, yeah, it breaks up. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember. This. There's a surface uh, tension issue with the airflow. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what they call it. Convexity or mm -hmm. so concavity. So like yeah. What? Concavity. Con no, it's a turbulence. Turbulence. Yeah. So it helps with flying. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there are some birds like owls that have feathering at the back of their wings so they can fly silently. It might have, I don't, I don't think there's any reason butterflies need to fly silently, but uh, it does affect flight. 
And then there's the buckwheat blues. This is the genus Ariagum, or Euphilodes, rather. And uh, Euphilodes are one of our most difficult groups here in Washington. And there's at least uh, 10 buckwheat uh, species used by, uh, by Euphilodes. We'll be talking more about that later. And then there's the Mormon metal, metal mark, the only metal mark we have in uh, Washington. Now in Costa Rica, you probably just have lots of uh, metal oh, marks yes. down there, but we, we've got one. <laughs> and, and he uses a bunch of the buckwheats. Anyway, the total association of the butterflies that, that feed on buckwheats, use them as host plants, is 44 in Washington, at least 44. That, that message is going to be increasing. Some of our most confusing butterflies rely on buckwheats. This is one of the reasons we're, reason we're so interested in buckwheats. The more we study the buckwheats, the more we can know about the butterflies, and the more we can sort out these difficult butterflies. All of the euphilodes and some of the most confusing acronyms, which is previous, are buckwheat users. Both groups are believed to include undescribed new species in our area. So we're coming up with, with very probably at least a couple new species of, of blues in Washington uh, that feed on these buckwheats. <coughs> Most of the euphilodes are very similar, very confusingly similar, and they're variable. Uh, and some of the acronyms, the acronym blue and the lupin blue, likewise, are, are somewhat variable and, and pretty hard to tell apart. And uh, everyone, the first thought people have is, well, let's do genetics. We'll figure these out by genetics. Well, first of all, the genetics really, really haven't been done in this group. And secondly, it's going to be difficult to do them because very closely related species uh, tend to be difficult to analyze with, with uh, genetic analysis. Can't, it's hard to come up with real conclusive information. Would you say that, John? Absolutely. Especially barcode genes. Mm -hmm. Barcoding, yeah, barcoding things. Not too good. Conventional wisdom. This is kind of our starting point. Uh, what, what others have read. <coughs> Most euphilodes species use only one buckwheat host. If two buckwheats are used, they will be closely related buckwheats. They'll be in the same subgenes. Now, this is a guy named Gordon Pratt, who uh, is a researcher down in University of California, Riverside. And uh, this is his thesis, and apparently it's pretty true in California. There are, uh, he, he does have some blues that use two buckwheats, but he says when, when, he, when they use two buckwheats, they're going to be very closely related. Now, what we have up here in Washington is quite different. We, we have what may be a single species that might use as many as four or five buckwheats, and that's, that's what we're really struggling with. We're trying to see if, if indeed these, these are different species of buckwheat blues that are using them. Or, or, yeah. Uh, Euphilodes, that's the buckwheat blues, lay their eggs on unopened buds for early flowers. Uh, and the young larvae feed mm -hmm. first on pollen, then on flowers and seeds. They're, they're strictly flower feeders, the euphilodes, the buckwheat blues. They don't feed on the <coughs> leaves or the stems, just flowers. So they have to, uh, the females have to lay their eggs very early in the blooming cycle with these buckwheats. That's the only time that they can lay their eggs and expect to have their larvae develop properly. <coughs> and so reliable most plant associations, associations are considered important. Whatever buckwheat these, these blues are associated with may define what the species of blue is. That's one of the ways that we try to figure these things out. And examination of the genitalia is important, uh, but interpretation of what we're seeing with the genitalia is, is another matter. They're complex, they're difficult. Uh, we've been fussing around with them and, and we're finding them pretty difficult. <clears throat> now, the Euphilodes blues come in two flavors. We have the Batoides group <clears throat> and the Anoptes group. Um, these are the so-called dotted blue group and the square spotted blue group. And uh, these have very different genitalia. Uh, and to look at them, well, I don't know I can tell these are, these are snaps. Well, in, in the rather extreme cases we see here, they aren't easy to tell apart. But the problem is there are blends. You find areas where they, they are somewhere in between these two forms and just looking at them, they can be pretty darn hard to tell apart to the, to the group. And when that happens, the next thing we have to do is look at the genitalia. Uh, these, are, uh, these are the male genitalia. If, if we think of this as, uh, this is the very tip end of the tail of the butterfly and its head is way out here somewhere. It's facing to the right. This is the tail and we're looking at it from kind of below here, uh, ventrolateral side, side view from below. And, here we're looking at it from above, straight down. And this, this is the Anoptes group, 
And uh, this is the Fatoides group, the other group. You see that genitalia are very different. And so while we have these blues that look very much alike and they're easy to confuse, when you look at the genitalia, you say, how could, how could we have missed this? I mean, this is too easy. It is very different. But when we get into uh, the genitalia, trying to separate species within these groups, say we're in the Batoides group, the corresponding group, if we try to separate species based on the genitalia, it gets a lot more difficult. Here's a couple of examples. You see, here's uh, this is the species that's found on uh, the round-headed desert buckwheat, and this is one that's found on the pine desert buckwheat. And look at the difference in these teeth. You see these teeth sticking down, they're really quite different, but they're also variable, quite variable. And so we're, we're looking at all these, these, uh, these various functions, the various shapes of these uh, genitalia, and it's, it's pretty confusing trying to figure out what's important and what's not, and what's, what's simple variation. The, uh, <coughs> this, by the way, is the exact same specimen as this. Look how different they look. Just a little bit of a turn under the microscope, just a little bit of a rotation, and they look entirely different. I mean, how can this big, massive tooth here be these two little sharp teeth? Well, they're, they're kind of so three-dimensional. Hmm? Sticking out the other way. They're sticking out the other off. way. They are, yeah. And uh, when you look down from above or from below, uh, what you have is you have these, these two arms called the oncus, which, which are the main arms of the genitalia, and the teeth stick straight in toward each other, but they're, they're kind of three-dimensional. They, they stick in, and they also stick down and sideways, and, and uh, so trying to figure out exactly what view to look at them to compare with another set of genitalia is, is, uh, is quite a problem. Here's a bunch of different populations of, of the uh, Batoides group uh, genitalia. Look at all the variation we see here. See this one has a big massive tooth with a little side teeth in it. This one has several long slender teeth. They, they really vary. Uh, one thing that I think I've stumbled on that might be, uh, might be worthwhile is, is the, our most common Batoides group, most common square spotted blue, the one that feeds on Heracleoides primarily, uh, has these massive teeth. And the one that we have way up in the high mountains, the so-called uh, Euphorbia glaucon, uh, uh, feeds on the uh, sulfur flower, has teeth that look like this. And uh, they, they, that seems to be a fairly good difference. But a lot of these other populations, here's one that's on Douglas Island, there's just one on Old Alpha, all these different buckwheats, and they're all kind of different, different variations on the theme. So what's, what's real and what's Variation is, is, uh, is part of what we're trying to sort out here. It's pretty confusing. Here are the four subgenera of buckwheats that we have. And now that we look a little bit at the blues, let's look at the plants. We have these four genera of buckwheats. These are the perennial plants. These are woody plants that come up year after year. Some of these live many years. Uh, and these are the annual plants, which come up new each year. We only have five species of annuals in Washington. And we have, what do we have, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, nine, four, what is it, 16 species of, of uh, perennial plants. These are the plants that <coughs> host butterflies. I mean, these, just about all of these are really good host plants, uh, larval host plants for, for butterflies. Uh, well, these are, are mostly not. Some of the, one of the problems with the annual buckwheats is, uh, well, this one is eradicated. It don't, no longer exists in Washington. Uh, this one is extremely rare. It's found only in, on the most uh, secretive, inaccessible parts of the Hanford uh, County Preservation. Uh, this one was reported by Hitchcock and Cronquist 40, 50 years ago, but nobody has seen it since. Uh, so these are really difficult plants to find if they even exist in Washington. Uh, and that leaves just these two here, which are supposed to be fairly widespread, but they're still really hard to find. So we know very little about these annuals. We know a lot about the annuals. And uh, also yeah. those that, that the, the annual group, yeah. uh, if you're not seeing them at the right time, if they're not blooming or something like that, you'll mistake them for something that's like a bed straw or gallium, you know. Yeah, they look they're, like a weed. Yeah, they don't look like anything until they yeah. actually bloom. Right, and, and there's not much information on when they bloom. I mean, if you look in the literature, it's, it's say they bloom from May to October. That's what yeah, right. Depending on where you have to be at the moment. Yeah, so. And I've, I've been to places where people say they've seen them, you know, I've been to those places again and again. I never find them. So they're hard to find. So Dave, if you go to some part of the geographic range where they are, uh, I 
assume in some ways. Yeah, well, we'll see, uh, we'll see a range map, actually a county record map later. They're pretty widespread. Both of, them, both of these two are pretty widespread in eastern Washington. Um, and I still don't find them. I still might find one, I'll bring it to you. Good, good. I need it. Um, okay, to separate these. <coughs> Yeah, and this, on this one here, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to separate your, your plant into one of these two subgenera. And why is it important? <clears throat> well, number one, people like Gordon Pratt say that it's important for identifying the butterfly. They say that, uh, like the Euphilodes, won't cross over from one subgenus to the other. They won't use two plants from different subgenera. Well, we're finding that's not true here in Washington, but it's good to recognize what, uh, what subgenus the plants are in. The other reason it's, it's good to know how to separate them is because look at, look at the number of species in each subgenus. It's about equally divided. So if you can separate them easily you've, uh, to, limit, to identify the plant, you've knocked half your um, potential species right off the list. So you're halfway there. The, uh, the, the number one key that, uh, uh, the number one feature that the keys all look at is, is the shape of the base of the flower. Now this, this is a little individual flower. Um, <clears throat> this, this unit here, this little cup at the base will, will actually have maybe six to 10 flowers in it. This shows just one, but you, what you do is you pluck out one flower and you look at it with your little hand lens. These little, this little flower is only gonna be a quarter of an inch long and you look at the stem base. And uh, the key is, does the flower have a stem-like base? Um, there's, there's always this little notch. You see that little notch? That's defined as the, the, the that's the, defined as the bottom of the flower. This, everything above here is the flower, and everything below it is the stem. So you're looking at this part of the flower. It does that part of the flower look stem-like? Is it, is it narrow and, and uh, like a stem? That one obviously did look stem-like. Now here's another one. This is strictum. Uh, you notice. There's, there's your line. You notice the base of the flower is not stem-like, it's just trunking. So that one is not stem-like, and this was in the other subgenus. And here's another version of the one that does, does not have a stem-like base. This base of this flower is conical, and there's your little line. So, so these last two are both in the <coughs> subgenus you cite one, which are not stem-like base, and the first one is in the <coughs> subgenus oligogonum, which does have a stem-like base. Another thing, I thought I took these out of here. What happened? <coughs> this actually shows a blooming sequence of, of buckwheats, and the reason I, uh, I intended to take it out is because it's it's not too not too uh, accurate. Spherocephalum here it needs needs to be extended back a ways. But but anyway, this is just to show that these, these buckwheats don't all bloom at the same time. They <coughs> they are pretty staggered. <coughs> uh, this is intended to be the low elevation blooming sequence. You notice down here we have a couple that. Are, uh, this is not the scale. These, these two plants actually bloom way late in the season. And all these others bloom uh, from the spring up uh, to maybe mid-summer. These, these basically bloom in late summer to autumn. And, uh, and as, we, as we move uphill, uh, this is at mid-elevation, then, then we have a different series of, of buckwheat. Some of the ones we have at the low elevation don't occur in the mid-elevation. And uh, the, the, the blooming periods kind of get reshuffled a little bit. They're not quite what they were down at the lower elevation. And then when we get up into the high elevation, we, we have a new species. We have Pyromifolium here, Marifolium, Flavum. We have all these later uh, high elevation plants start showing up while a lot of the early plants have dropped out simply because they're either not there at the higher elevations or, or they're blooming at a different time period. So knowing the sequence of buckwheats helps a lot for, uh, for identification. Let's go through first the subgenus oligogon. And by the way, this is one of the pages in the, in the uh, DVD that, that I be selling here. This is what the pages look like on the different species. Uh, this is the time desert buckwheat. This is our earliest buckwheat. And a very pretty little plant, a real compact, uh, woody little plant that grows out in the rocky shrub step. And uh, it's just covered with these blooms when it's in, in the peak of bloom. Uh, it starts off with, with red flowers, or red buds, which turn yellow as, as the uh, flowers open up. The uh, leaves are 
roll down so that the underside of the leaf is, is just about completely uh, invisible. You can't see it because of the side to roll down. It's, and so the leaves are almost tube-like or tubular. And we found a, a euphelobius on this plant. Uh, it it uh, hadn't been reported before that we have it here in Washington. We're not sure what it is. It's, it's in, the, in the square spotted blue group. But uh, this is one of these mysterious butterflies that we're not, not really sure just what it is. Uh, there's some of over there. And here's some pin specimens. See, they tend to, these are, these are other euphemonies over here, and you see that they tend to be a little bit on the small size, size small side compared to, to other euphemonies. But uh, these, these are early flying. We have a population of the Mishnabri Cooley, and uh, this last, uh, last th actually this year, we found a very large population of them in Grant County, right on the, on the uh, east bank of the Columbia River, near the Vantage Bridge. There's lots of them there. And the uh, next plant that follows after Timoides is Sparacephalum, another quite a striking plant. You see them on the hillside here. They just, they just cover a whole hillside. They're big, round buckwheats. Uh, these things can be three, four feet across. Yes? Excuse me. Uh, so we're talking about plants that they will fit as an adult and not for host plants. Oh, these are all host plants. Oh, host plants. Uh, okay. but Almost invariably, the butterflies that use them as host plants also use nectar from them. Oh, I see. Uh, not, not strictly. The, especially the males will wander around, they'll get, they'll get nectar <laughs> wherever they can, but the females pretty much stay only on the host plants. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question, Kim? Oh, okay. Uh, Sarasaphalum, well, it, looks, it kind of looks like uh, the first plant. Uh, the first plant typically is, is like this big. Sarasaphalum is like this big. I mean, it's a much larger plant. <sighs> Uh, and we, we have uh, Euphelotes who use this plant too. For, for some time, um, uh, I thought that there was a distinct break in time, like three week break between the time that Tyblades blooms and the time Scarcephalus blooms. But this year I found uh, down in, in, in Grant County, down along the Columbia River, they actually overlap a little bit. So it depends on where you are, you get very different ideas of what's going on. Here's another picture of the Sparacephalum. Uh, there, uh, you can see the Columbia River and the Banning Bridge we just up here, so that's where we are. Very pretty flowers. And here's the uh, here's one of the butterflies that we find on, on these flowers. This one is actually reared from the Ellensburg Overlook, another place they occur. And uh, here's some pin specimens. Again, you can see that these these are large butterflies. Uh, I mean, as, as the genus goes, these are some of the largest eupolonies we have, and, and here are some others for comparison. Uh, the, so these ones that feed on Sparacephalum are really good, fairly good sized. Now in Oregon, we have a different thing happening. This is Sparacephalum from Oregon. The, the, uh, this is down by Burns, Oregon. The plants are, you can tell they're Sparacephalum. You know, they have the same kind of leaves, and. They have, uh, but they're, they're kind of a shaggy appearance. They don't have these nice rounded appearance. And look at the length of the flower stems. I mean, it's long flower stems. Mm. And if we look at the ones that we have, <coughs> well, back up. You see, the flower stems are the, the flower stems barely reach out beyond the, the green leaves. They're really short. But uh, but down in Oregon, they look like that. But it's the same same species. It's a different subspecies, probably different variety. But it's the same plant. And the interesting thing is we we have the Euphelotes down there in Oregon too. But you see how much this looks like a square spotted blue. It has the big square markings on the front wing. But it's not. This is a dotted blue. This is one of these crossovers. This is Euphelotes ancilla. So this this is. Completely different butterfly using the same plant in a different state next to a different state. So this is this is these are some of the puzzling things we're finding in this group. Mm -hmm. Next species, uh, Ariagum positum. Again, this is northern buckwheat, the big showy buckwheats that we see fairly early in the spring. They can be white, they can be bright golden. They have these big uh, uh, heart-shaped leaves at the base, and these things will, will grow. Uh, probably two feet tall, they're, they're, they're big plants. And 
they, they host actually a number of, of butterflies. This is this is a field of, of composite them up in Research Creek. This is actually quite close to Garrison Springs, and this is within the perimeter of the fire right now, so I don't know how this is going to fare. <coughs> and here's the uh, here's the Columbia blue. This is an Alpes group, this is the dotted blue group, and here's a pair of butterflies which are on composite and uh, that this is their host plant. Now I've been going through the Oligogon and the other first subgenus of buckwheats. I'm, I'm doing a switch over here. I'm looking at Periogonum elatum. We're not done with the Oligogon yet. <coughs> the reason I switched is this plant, which is called buckwheat, is also used by the by the Columbia blue, and this violates Gordon Pratt's premise that uh, they don't really cross over between subgenera, but we have this one that does. And uh, elatum, and you can see these big fields of elatum like this down the lower research and, and we, we see these, these uh, very tall open plants with these uh, rather sparse flowers. These are very persistent. They, these, uh, the leaves on these will per persist way in the late summer and the flowers, uh, you, can, you can still find some fairly fresh flowers right now if you go over to Kittitas County. They're still blooming, I'm getting kind of tired now. And you see they're very widespread. They're all over Oregon and Washington. And here again is, is the Columbia blue. This is kind of a shaggy specimen. But as near as we can tell, this is the same butterfly that's using the northern buckwheat. They look the same. But here's the problem. Uh, here's two sets of, actually there's four sets uh, of, of this butterfly. These two are collected in Research Canyon. This is down in the lower part of Research. This is way down where you're still on the shrub step before you start up that long hill. Uh, there's lots of elatum down there, the tall buckwheat, and, and, and the butterflies are down there. And then way up, much higher, up where the, where the switchbacks are, up getting close to where the fire is, we have them again, but on a different plant. They're up on, they're on the northern buckwheat up there. But if you look in between, you don't find them. And uh, these two sites are about two miles apart. These were collected the same day. These are collected on elatum. And these are collected on composite. And this one is uh, 1,700 feet higher. This is a 1,700 feet higher than this on the same day. And we have this gap in between where they don't fly. So if they're the same species, how can we have this? How can we have them? Yeah, John? Well, now you're cheating a little bit. When did, when did this sample take place? Was it one of the scrunched up years where the spring was really bad? It was uh, July 13th last year. Uh -huh. So, I mean, the season, uh, like, remember when we had the national meeting in Leavenworth, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we went down to Reese Creek, <coughs> the same situation, that had been a really, really bad spring. And when it finally started going, everything kicked in. The uphill uh, got caught up, so we had this thing going on simultaneously where it normally would be more separate from time. Okay. So, you know, there the may be a little, you have to do it over a decade, really. Yeah, that's true. And actually, I, I mentioned this business of, of thymoides and spherocephalum actually overlapping their blooms down on the Columbia. And that's be, that was this year. And that's because the year was, right. we didn't have a spring. Our spring was just all jammed into early summer. And so everything happened at once. And, and it, that may not happen normally. We might not have those two together. But anyway, uh, the interesting thing is we have two other uh, collections of the same butterfly. These are from uh, Cowichee Canyon. We've often hiked down in Cowichee Canyon. And uh, these are these are on the lab, the same host plant as here. These are on composite. And we only see a, a, a few of these. There's a, there's a whole section of them here. Um, and they're, these were collected in, on the same place. These are on the same hill, the very same hill in Cowichee Canyon. But they were six weeks apart. So how are we going to have the same species on two different plants six weeks apart. Elatum is all gone, it's all dried up by the time, or vice versa, compositum is all gone and dried up by the time elatum is blooming, and there's this big gap in between. Go ahead. <laughs> no, when you get done, I'll explain. Okay. Um, one thing we have found since is there is there is an intermediate buckwheat, but it doesn't, it's not used everywhere, and it's, it's uh, aerogonum strictum that does bloom between these two. And so there's at least some areas where we have small populations of what appears again to be the same, uh, the same Euphilodes using a third buckwheat that's, that's located between these two. Uh, but 
we, we find there's four places where these occur, and they're all small populations. So there might be a way that these are linked together. If you're on. Okay. <laughs> Look, here's the way you have to break it down. You're a butterfly, you can take advantage of every opportunity presented to you, right? You got two juicy opportunities, one's early, one late, on plants that don't overlap sometimes in time and certainly in space. Sometimes in space, certainly in time. So what do you do? Well, you want to take advantage of both of them, and you know that it's going to be a big resource if you actually undergo speciation, become different species. That's hard to do because you're always getting influx from the other one over time. So what you do is just say, okay, every female that lays an egg on a certain you know, selected food plant, their offspring will always emerge late, every female. And so like males can do the, the hoochie-coo and actually get genetic differentiation, but if it's a female linked, uh, behavior, then they can choose these different food plants without losing specific integrity. That's that's how that happens. Anybody understand that? <laughs> well, I'll do it again. If you got two things that you really want, you're going to do everything you have to do. If you, as a butterfly, you know, sit down in the boardroom and say, "Okay, we're going to vote on this." Uh, from this point thenceforth, every female that emerges as an elatum from an elatum generation, no matter what male she mates with, from where in the range. She will always lay her eggs on the alarm, and she will always have the late or, or the alarm regime, vice versa for the composite. No matter what kind of genetic interchanges are taking place as regards males, because males are like that. I mean, every male butterfly is just, they're less lusty. And they also will move. These things don't just hang around. Males will go to the mud and they'll move from one place to the next. So as long as the females, I mean, we all know that males are useless bags of sperm. And females are the essential moving force of all of this. And, and so if the females are, are true to their food plant, this whole thing can, can manifest. And this has actually been proved in other places in the world uh, with dimorphic butterflies. And another possibility is we might have what they call incipient speciation. We might actually have these two populations getting separated, and they're they're on. Well, this is what that would look like, but it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So as near as we can tell, we've got these the same species of butterfly yeah. that, that's that's coming in these. I think it's pretty species. clever to be able to do that, exploit numerous resources that are diverse, and still not lose you know the overall you know genetic integrity. Yeah. yeah. Whoever designed it was pretty smart. Let's go back into the oligogonum, the first, the first uh, subgenus. And this is another very important um, uh, buckwheat. This is Heraclioides, and it's, uh, it's kind of a shaggy looking buckwheat. It has these long, lupin like uh, rosettes of leaves that, that are around the stem, and, and they also have them at the base of the flowers. And Heraclioides uh, uh, is, is a very, as you can see, it's very widespread in Washington and Oregon, which is in almost every county. And uh, one of our most widespread euphemodes uh, uh, uses this as its primary host plant. That's, it's, it's unfortunately an unnamed euphemodes. It's, it's in the process of, of being named by Andy Warren, uh, but we don't have a name for it quite yet. And this is it. Uh, in fact, this is a female. This is an Elkite, so we're in Kittis County, and the female is on positive on the Heracleodes. Plants, notice the state of the plant. It's in, it's in uh, bud or very early bloom. That's when they like to lay their eggs. Yes? Yes? Well, it may not be officially described, though. You have, in your book, given it a common name, right? I've given it a tentative common name just so we have something to call it. Uh, call it the Columbia blue, but uh, I mean the uh, Cascadia blue. But uh, that's not a formal name. Whoever describes this butterfly can give it a real name. But that's until we get there. So. Sure, it's not the Hercules light blue. <laughs> Hercules. Heracles. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Hercules light blue. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here's a here's a close up of, of one that was reared from up in Chumstick Mountain on the same kind of plant. And up here, this is up at the Eden Valley Ranch where we had our our annual meeting this this last uh, this last spring. This was right outside one of the cabins. Here's Douglas eye. Now this this uh, looks kind of like Heracleoides when we just looked at it, but this is a smaller plant, and these leaves are much smaller than the Heracleoides. These these are little leaves. Um, in fact, it looks more like the little Timoides, the earlier plant, than it does like Heracleoides. Uh, except the leaves are not rolled down like the like the um, Timoides. When you look at the underside of the leaf, you can see the whole underside. It just the edges are, are a little bit curved. 
and it has these little pom-pom uh, uh, heads, these nice little round heads that, that go up. Uh, for several years, I tried to, tried to associate butterflies with this plant, with the Douglas eye, and I had a lot of trouble doing it. I'd see an occasional butterfly, an occasional eupolotes on this plant, uh, never saw the position, and usually it would just be like one butterfly, while well, lots of butterflies were on Heracleoides nearby. But up here on uh, on Clock and Pass Road, this is this is quite a ways up in the Wenatchee Mountains. Uh, when you get get up fairly high on the hillside, you get up under those big power lines up there. You know where that area is. And this, I found this big big field that had virtually nothing but Douglas eye. Way off on the edge, there there are a few Heracleoides, but this whole area is is like 100% Douglas eye. And uh, there are eupolotes all over. They were mating on these plants, and they clearly were, were using Douglas eye. Uh, and then uh, I had looked and looked at, at Elk Heights, uh, again, this place on, right along I-90, uh, over by Clean Elm, and uh, had tried to, tried to find anything on the same plant, really came up dry until this year. And apparently these have a very short time period that Douglas eye is, is, is Prime for own position because I walked into uh, Douglas Eye and they had these eupolotes all over and, uh, and there were none on the Heracleoides, which is just the opposite of, of what I'd always seen there before. So it's, it's a very narrow time niche. Yeah, John? It's interesting you note that uh, the, my observations with Douglas Eye were in Clock and Pass and Chickasaw Hill. Okay. And then they had Fort Lewis too. I may just wandered it at the right time. You might have been right at the right time. I went to the Chickasaw Hill that same day. And there was, uh, it was too late, there was nothing down there. And so I went on up the hill and found this other place, but yeah. But anyway, uh, so, so they were very definitely using Douglas Eye, but in just a little bit different time slot. And Douglas Eye seems to be a fairly uh, brief blooming period plant. It, it doesn't seem to be prime for butterflies very long, so you have to be there at the right time. Hey Dave, on that picture, if they laid the eggs on the ground, Aren't they mating kind of late? Uh, these, these are late, yeah, you're right. These, these flowers are pretty much open. What they'll usually do is, is they'll find another flower head that is mostly buds, and they'll actually jam their abdomen right down between the buds and, and stick the egg down in there. Or if the flowers are starting to open, uh, they'll, they will lay their eggs on the inside of the petal and they open the flower. But uh, they, they like to get them very early in the season. But yeah, this, this is, now again, we didn't have spring this year, remember? So, uh, this was a time period when we had a lot of rain. We finally had a clear day and went running over there. And uh, the flowers kept, of course, growing, but the butterflies probably weren't flying. So they may have been laying eggs in a suboptimal time. That could have been happening. Unbelievable. This is a sulfur flower. Uh, as, as I've noted up here, it's by far the most variable buckwheat. Uh, this James Ravel uh, uh, buckwheat guy has this has described or at least lists 45 varieties of this, this plant. Uh, most of our buckwheats may have two or three or varieties. This one has 45. It's an it's amazingly variable plant. You see this one here, this is this is uh, uh, quite a small one with, with tight heads. This one is this is house neck. Yeah, this is actually the smallest one of the, of the bunch, just a close-up picture. This this guy only grows, grows like three or four inches high but it does have a, a, a more open head. This was the one that the uh, Buckley Blues, the uh, Eucalyptus Glaucon feeds on the Chumstick Mountain. Uh, but there's all these different forms, and uh, they're very, they always have these, uh, this rosette of leafy bracts, they call them. They don't call these leaves, but leafy bracts, right below the, where the flower head forks. And uh, in, in many of these, the flower head will actually fork a second time, and if they do, there will be a leafy bracket under that as well. And the, the, the leaves at the base tend to, tend to be these nice, neat little rosettes. They're good, kind of a, excuse me, kind of a neat little plant. Now, this is another uh, variety of the same plant that grows in the Blue Mountains. This is Elliptigum. Look how different it is. It just branches and branches and branches, and it's kind of a, kind of a wild, sprawly uh, buckwheat. But this is also unbelievable. And uh, here, here's that patch of Umbladum I was talking about earlier. This is, this is one of the two patches that I've seen and researched 
Uh, and, and this is this is in the burn area, so we hope hope these plants will survive. Oh yeah, we need it. Hope so. And here's a here's a patch of them later from eastern Oregon. Uh, that is, this is out on the high desert and in sandy soil, and these, these nice, neat, big patches of, of leaves are, are they're like a like a map. And this is like four or five feet across. And then you get these little individual blooms coming up. And uh, the same butterfly, you can always block that was, was on this one as, as we find up in uh, Chumstick Mountain. And here's Laupon. And here's a pair of Laupon from Mountain. Now, uh, this summer, um, Bill Yake and Jeanette Barreca uh, were, uh, were climbing around over in, in east, northeastern Washington. This is up in Mount Shawila in Stevens County. And they, they found a, a population of Eupalotes on, again, the, uh, the sulfur flower. And, and so I had to go running over there and take a look for myself. The too. next day, huh, Dave? Hmm? The next day? No, it was, it was several days later. That, oh, this sorry. was this, this, this was during the left side of the But uh, interestingly, these these uh, plants are, are completely different variety. These, these are big plants. I mean, they're, they're growing as, as big as only I've ever seen anywhere. Um, also, when I looked at the genitalia of these butterflies, they, they don't really look like the genitalia from Chumstick Mountain. You know, the, you know the ones with the long, slender teeth? These look like the broccoli eaters. These have the massive teeth. What do we have? I'm not sure. We're calling it well done for now. <coughs> and here's, uh, here's some pen specimens. Of, these are on the, uh, the small uh, um, Alpine version of the sulfur flower up in Chumstick Mountain. Here is a really cool buckwheat. This is, uh, well, you can see I've got Yakima County in gray with the question mark. Again, that's this James Rebell has listed on a couple of his, of his websites, he's listed this plant as occurring in Yakima County. Um, I've never talked to any botanist who's ever seen it up there, and I've looked at all the lists of plants that are up by the Native Plant Society in different outfits, and nobody missed it from there. But James Travell apparently found it up there. And the reason it's interesting is <coughs> where it occurs down in Oregon, there's an area down by Bend about in here where, uh, where, where these plants grow out on these cinder flats, and they have, uh, they have uh, an acmonoid, a, a plebeus associated with them, which is a new species. It's, it's one that's in the process of being described. And so if if it's found down there, and if we have it in Washington, we can find this new species in Washington. What's interesting about this flower is, well, first of all, this is the habitat. These are these, these really neat cinder fields. They look like a desert, but they're covered with these with these uh, with these neat little buckwheats. There's actually two species of buckwheats out there, and, and this is what they look uh, look like closer up. The yellow flowers are the males, and the ones that are mostly red are the females. And uh, uh, they, uh, if you think again about the life history of the Euphelodes butterflies, the larvae feed on first, uh, first instar probably on pollen, and then from them on they feed on the, the seeds in the flower, the little seeds at the base, uh, the developing seeds at the base of the flower. So where are the larvae going to develop? Which, which of these two? Only on the females, that's where the seeds are. But the pollen's on the other one. Hmm? But the pollen's on the other one. Yeah, but some of them probably gets carried okay. over. There. Yeah. So, yeah, good point. Um, and so, where do you always see the females? Always on the red ones. Always. Okay. And so, here's a pair that's mating. These are the red ones, they're on the female flowers. And uh, anytime you see one while depositing, it's on the female flower. So how do they tell? I don't know. But they know. Anyway, this is a uh, this is apparently an undescribed species of Euphelodes. Uh, I don't know that anyone's working on describing it, but, but it is considered by the experts to be uh, another undescribed species. Pyrolifolium. This is the neat little buckwheat that grows. It's kind of like squished right down the ground, a real low growing little thing, and it grows way up in the high altitudes. But this is also found down in the same place, that's Blatz in Oregon. And uh, this is close to the, the other undescribed blue. This is, this is a, uh, a, a plebeus butterfly that, that feeds on this little plant. And uh, here's, uh, 
some habitat in Washington that shows the pine roll call in. Uh, this is a cinder flat up on, uh, on Mount Adams where I, uh, I was out there this summer. This unfortunately is in the middle of another forest fire. Uh, but you can see all the little, you see the little white blocks. The pyrofolium actually has white flowers and they, they, they mature to pink, as you see here. But they, they start out white. Here's another patch. This is up at uh, Corral Pass up in uh, the southeast corner of, of uh, Pierce County, just out uh, not far from Mount Rainier. And this flat down here has pyrofolium. So we see it up in the mountains. And, uh, and here's, here's the butterfly. This is down in Oregon. And uh, again, this is one that's in the process of very slowly being described. And when it gets a name, uh, we have found these, I haven't, but others have found what is apparently the same thing here in Washington. Uh, when Merrill, Merrill uh, Peterson, Peterson, Green Dead. <laughs> when Merrill was here last, last month for his talk, he brought some uh, specimens that he collected on St. Helens. And we were looking at them and comparing them for these, to these ones that I have from Oregon. And they really look similar. Now the ones from Oregon have these heavy black maculations and his have lighter spots. But, but they look like they're probably the same thing. And then this summer, David James, when he was up in the Keanaway drainage in, in Kittitas County, climbed up a high mountain called, uh, called uh, Iron Peak or Iron Mountain. And he found a population of them up, up, up there. I haven't seen his material yet, just pictures. But, but it looks like we have the same species here in Washington, so when it gets a name, we'll add a new species to Washington. And here's, here's a picture of uh, some of the ones from Dutchman Platts. Um, they're, um, they're small. They're, they're small compared to, these are lupinite type, these are lupin, uh, lupin blue types. Uh, they have that kind of genitalia and they're closely related, but they're much smaller than, than lupin blues. Uh, and they did different from other characters. Here I'm going to flap them. The yellow buckwheat is, is a neat plant. It grows. Uh, it shows them in a number of counties here from different uh, botanical lists. But actually, the, the best place to find it is in the Blue Mountains. That's the only place I've seen it. And it grows up at higher elevation. You have to be up 55, just about right at 5,500 feet elevation. It starts, uh, but it's not below there. It's a neat little palm. Um, uh, Buckwheat, I found nothing on this yet. I've only been there really at, uh, during prime bloom one time, but it, it doesn't even seem to drop butterflies for nectar. It just, it just sort of sits out there very pretty but not being used. So we don't know if anything uses this plant. But here's the habitat. It's quite nice up there. Now we're switching over to the other subgenus, the Eucycla. And uh, Eucycla, uh, uh, again, these are the ones with, in which the flowers don't have the stem-like bases. And uh, we, we, we already looked at the uh, elatum because I squeezed that in because of the butterfly. But this is another plant that looks a lot like the tall blackwood, the elatum. It's, it's a, it is tall, it's gangly, uh, very open, has the, the dainty little pink flowers, but the basal leaves are much different. Elatum has these, these big leaves and uh, nuke has these little, little rounded leaves. This is a plant that is, uh, doesn't have a very wide distribution in Washington. It's found up in western Yakima County up by White Pass, and it's found around Mount St. Helens. Those are the main places. <coughs> Here's the habitat where it occurs. All you have to do is jump off this cliff and you can find lots of them. Uh, they're, they're really pretty thick. This is the White Pass Highway, and we're probably about, uh, I'd say, three miles from the pass, which is behind us in this picture. Look, we're looking down toward River Rock Lake. And uh, this area has lots of this plant. And uh, this is a butterfly. This is one of the butterflies we use it. This is a true Euphemia zanopis, the true dotted blue. This is what we used to think was all over Washington uh, until they kind of revised the group and, and they decided that what we have, most of what we have, is the Columbia blue, which has been split from this. So we have the, the true zanopis up there on, on the nude. This is what the larva looks like. Euphemia's larvae are all kind of similar. They're, they're white with these red marks. Uh, but we also have this, this butterfly that is on these, these high nude plants. And this appears to be uh, the Ackman blue. And um, this is an unusual Ackman blue. Ackman blues are small and they live down in the desert, down, down in the lowlands. But this one is much larger and it, and it grows only on this plant, only on nude, and it's defined at high elevations. And 
Andy Warren, when he did his Butterflies in Oregon, found the very same assemblage down in Oregon. He found these larger atlanglyphs up at high elevation on just this one kind of plant. So we have a population of these up there by, uh, uh, by White Pass. And these are actually pretty common up there. This is Strictum. Strictum, uh, I, I think of this messy dog here. That's kind of what it looks like. It has lots of stems and it is kind of messy looking. The stems are different lengths. It just, and it, uh, the leaves at the base are real crowded. They can be green or they can be bluish. Uh, and and the, where the flower stem first forks, uh, there's, always, um, there's always a flower that's right smack dab in the center of the fork. Or if it's on a, a longer stem, that stem comes right out of the center of the fork. So that's one of the things that you know, I de define strictum. It gets real widespread. Uh, it's not used very much by butterflies, but we have found uh, the kind of Euphelodes, actually the, uh, the Columbia blue on, on this plant in four different places in the state now. This is what uh, strictum habitat looks like. This is down in Lower Research Creek Canyon. And this is one of the first places I actually found larvae on this plant. And uh, here's, uh, here's a uh, butterfly that I reared from larvae from this plant. It clearly a dotted blue. I mean, it's, it's got the, we got the separated orange spots that, that don't meld together into a bar. Uh, and I examined the genitalia. It's, it's, it's definitely a dotted blue, uh, Columbia, Columbia blue. And here's some adults that have been collected from the same plant. These were up in Joaquin Canyon in Chelan County. This is another neat little uh, buckwheat. This is Ovalifolium, the open leaf buckwheat. You see it has a scattered range. It's, uh, it's found mostly at high elevation. And you say, well, well what about this area? That's all, uh, that's all desert. It's desert, but it's high desert. The, the Oregon, uh, Southeast Oregon uh, deserts, it's all at a high elevation. It's like 4,000 feet all over this area. So it's still pretty high down there. And Hogan Farm has these neat little pom-pom flowers uh, and, and these neat little stems that it has these crowded little bluish leaves. The blue on both surfaces are covered with hairs and then sort of bluish. Uh, it's a, just a nifty little plant. These, these, are, these are mostly small. They only grow a few inches tall. Uh, by contrast, down in Oregon, we get Hogan uh, Farm that look like this. this these are these are probably 10 inches or 11 inches tall, and they're bright yellow flowers. So uh, that's quite a different. Uh, here again, this one floor it looks quite different. Uh, this is the Craters of the Moon National Monument down in south of southern Idaho. And these are all these little blue spots are with Alphonian plants. Thousands of them. You look out over these cinder flats. And say, oh my goodness! I should have been here when these were blooming. So I don't. I don't know what uses these. I know they have eucalyptus and they have plebeus down there in the, the craters of the moon. Um, I'd love to go there sometime when the butterflies are on. Bowery. What is it? Bowery. You think it's Bowery? Yeah. Ooh, that could be cool. And uh, this is our own about uh, foliage habitat. This is the Corral Pass. And, and you see the little ovalifolians all over this rocky ridge top. And they're neat little plants. And we, we have actually Pluvius lupini that use them up here. And here is the lupini, the, the lupin blue that, that was on these plants at, at Corral Pass. And, uh, and here's some specimens from the same area. They, they're just pretty typical lupini. But we also have a Euphelodes, which uses this plant. And this is up on top of Chumstick Mountain. Uh, we have a, uh, not an extensive number of the Ovalifolium plants up there, but there's some. And, and these, these butterflies use them up there. Now, this is right adjacent to, in fact, kind of intermingled with uh, the Umbelatum using uh, Euphelodes. They're all around there. And it's toward the end of the season when the Umbelatum is starting to fuzz out and it kind of end their blooming period. Uh, the the Ovalifolium is still going strong, but that's when you find the, the blues moving on to Ovalifolium. I think they're the same species. Remember I mentioned the real sharp, long uh, spines on the genitalia? These have that too. So I think they're the same thing. And I think that's what Andy thought too, wasn't it? That, yeah. 
the glorified uses for. These aren't cross and subgenera, though. Those are both from the same subgenera? Yeah, they're, they're both the same. Ovalifolia and Humble item. No, they're not. They're not. There's another one cross and subgenera. <laughs> another cross. Okay. Yeah, good point. Yeah, this, these are recycling. The yeah. Okay. Humble items in the own dog. Yeah, that's another cross, cross subgenera. Yeah, we're taking notes. Yep. Snow buckwheat. This, uh, this is a very late blooming uh, uh, buckwheat, and in fact, it's still blooming. It's at the late stages, but it's still blooming out on the shrub step. If you go down to uh, down to the Columbia River and, and areas in the Yakima County, you still see this this blooming. It has white blooms. It looks a lot like the uh, uh, strictum, the very Yakima strictum, except it has a different blooming period. Strictum bloom blooms in probably June, and this this blooms in September. So uh, they look very similar. The, the uh, uh, strictum has yellow flowers and nibium has white flowers. And uh, we've, we've been finding that uh, the Aquan blue, the true Aquan blue, uh, the small desert populations uh, <coughs> use this plant. These are, these are Aquan blues from Maryhill, down Maryhill Museum down in the Columbia. And you can, you can see the size. This is, this is Aquan, and this is their closest relative to Lupin. We'll see how much smaller they are, and uh, and that's that's an association we're working on right now. Here's another buckwheat. This is Microthecum. I'm running a little late, so I'll hurry. This is called Slenderbush buckwheat. It's actually fairly widespread. You see this in in large numbers around Yakima and uh, Vantage down along the Columbia River, uh, and it's. It's a real woody open plant, very woody and kind of kind of a scratchy thing. The flowers start out yellow and then they then they become, become white. It is used by some butterflies. Uh, it's it's known to be used. Well, I've found blue copper larvae on it. It's known to be used by the more the metal mark and, and by the gray hair streak. And maybe Aquan blue. We don't know about that one for sure. Here's the here's the gray hair streak. Uh, I believe. No, but this is just a picture of gray hair street. That's not really associated with the plant, but it does use it. And this is a, this is a neat buck, uh, buckwheat. This is Ariagum podium. It's called the Alcano buckwheat. And this was only described about 10 years ago. It's found only on the Hanford Reservation, down in Benton County. And uh, it's, it's blue. I mean, this, this isn't a, a poor picture. That's the color of it. The plants are blue. And, and the, the gravels, the volcanic fields that it grows, that grows on are kind of purple. So this, it looks like the color is all off on this picture. That, these are the true colors. And we haven't associated any uh, butterflies with this yet, but it's really hard to get on there. You have to get permits, and you have to have an escort and blah, blah, blah. You end up having one day to get over there, the winds blowing. You know, it's, it's difficult. Um, but the one time I was over there, we, we didn't find anything using it. Here's a, a picture of, of the field, this, this pumice field where the um, where the podium grows, and you can see the, the hills beyond are completely different color. They're green, um, and that's, this is this is true color. It's, it's blue, and it's blue plants on kind of purple blue ground, and they're real distinct. And then they're they're very flat. They grow they grow very well, and the timing is uh, is is kind of kind of the same as the cerocephalum, the ground pivot desert buckwheat. Uh, it's just a little bit later, but they do overlap. Now we're getting into the the annual buckwheat, we'll go through these pretty quickly. Uh, this is uh, Spurgeon, the Spurry buckwheat, and it's question mark in, in Washington. Hitchcock and Cronquist, the famous botanist of in Washington, said that this grows in the Columbia Basin, but nobody's ever reported it from there, so we don't know if it really does or not. But it's, it's certainly found down in Oregon, and there's a very special butterfly that's associated with it down there. This is, this is Spurgeon, it's all this red stuff. Uh, it's, it's a small plant. It just kind of grows like a, like a sprawly weed alongside roads and in these waste areas. When you get up and look close at it, uh, this is what it looks like. And this is the very interesting neat little butterfly that uses it, the uh, Leona's little blue. This, this, uh, this, species, this species was just discovered a few years ago and, and was described and they're trying to list it as endangered. And then this maculatum, this is another uh, buckwheat which has been found in, in Washington. You see I've marked it as extirpated. It was found actually in the city limits of Yakima, 
and it hasn't been seen for decades. It's, it still occurs in Oregon, but we, we've probably lost the species. Cernum is a real pretty little buckwheat with these hanging uh, lantern-like flowers. Uh, it, it is still in the state, but it's found only in deep in the very restricted parts of the Hanford Reservation. You can't get in there at all. Uh, and it's been found once uh, up in Franklin County, just across the river. So you're probably not going to see this plant. And, uh, and Baileyi, uh, the last two species are Baileyi and uh, by many of them are the two that we do have. And they have, they're fairly widely distributed in Washington and in Oregon, but I just can't find them. I know they're out there, but I just can't find these things. Uh, and they look quite a bit white. They have these little rosettes of, of white flowers with pink mid stripes that kind of surround the stem and, and have these, uh, these clasping bases. But uh, we really don't know if butterflies use these. They may, uh, we just don't know anything about these yet. You gotta find them first, though, don't you? Sorry. You gotta find them first. You gotta find them. <laughs> We've been looking and looking. And I just threw this in because this this is a, a knotweed, and uh, this this late summer of this year, uh, when I was looking at snow buckwheats and with Akmon blues, the, the, the blues were out also <coughs> visiting this polygonum species, uh, and they may be using polygonum too. So this is this is kind of a related plant. It's in the same family. And uh, so while you're looking at buckwheats, don't forget to look for knotweeds while you're out there. They could be finding some new host plants. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions? Oh, you know, we don't have time. Not story. <laughs> well, that's the way. Somebody that looked like um, in Houston, Washington, the species were all like east of the Cascades, except for the high elevation ones. Is that kind of true? Um, we have uh, uh, composite on the, the, the northern buckwheat on the west side. It's 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 kind of scarce, but we do have it. Um, Olympics. In the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got high elevations in the Olympics. You get. Uh, uh, oh yeah, there's a valve for me. Yeah. Um, but the. Uh, uh, the, the, the northern buckwheat grows out, out by an east cabin out there um, near the canal. There's, there's some of them out there. What? Yeah, haven't we seen it out there? The northern buckwheat? There's some out there. No. you got to show me that. Somebody planted it. It's a huya. Well, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, it's very young and it's a huya. Do you know what the huya means in the native tongue? <laughs> We're going to find out. <laughs> oh, <I know. laughs> um, anyway, there's not a lot of buckwheats uh, west of the mountains, except up, up uh, fairly high. Uh, if you go up to places like uh, uh, in the mountains near Mount Rainier, uh, you'll, you'll see uh, composite up there, uh, but not too far from the divide here there on the west side. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you. Then. Thank you. Thank you.